Hello and welcome to this evening's Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with AARP Arizona. During the month of March, we will focus on providing resources to help consumers manage their debt and savings and provide trusted information to make the best financial decisions. AARP is your wise friend and a fierce defender of consumers' finances, and we are helping you manage money while fighting on your behalf to protect what you've earned. We are here for you, and we will help you navigate the challenging road ahead. Visit us at aarp.org backslash money or aarp.org backslash money map. AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence of over 38 million members and 900,000 right here in Arizona, AARP works to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. We're glad you can join us this evening. I'll now turn things over to Marshall Shore. Welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. Oh, you know, it's hard to believe it is the end of March. Oh my gosh. And you know, I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. We have a great show here tonight. And I'm actually coming to you live from downtown Los Angeles, which I'll explain why in a little bit why I'm here. But it's all very exciting. We have an amazing guest coming up later on. So my name is Marshall Shore. I am your host this evening, as always. Now, today is indeed March 31st, and it is the last day of March, as tomorrow we get to hopefully play some nice practical jokes on folks. But, you know, so um, so in Arizona history, it's kind of an, an important day because it's Cesar Chavez Day. Now, this, this holiday basically is to celebrate the legacy of civil rights and labor movement activist, Cesar Chavez, and all that he and the co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association, later becoming United Farm Workers Union, all they did to make people's lives better. Now, this day, there is so much going on. It is also National Bunsen Burner Day. So all those Bunsen burners that you y'all used to like heat up test tubes and things well you know that is because the scientist from germany who created that was born today way back when before any of us were burning those little glass flames it is also a day where we celebrate the eiffel tower because this it, back in the 1800s is when it opened up for the public now it is also National Crayon Day because it's a day where we can all open a box, take a big whiff of those Crayolas and color in multitude of ways. It is also a day that she's kind of funny that way, which is a holiday that is used to celebrate women comedians. And one of the things I think is great that it's like, you know, it's like we have Senator Bernhardt who graduated from high school in the Valley. We also have Rusty Warren. So we have a rich comedy history and Leslie Barton, who actually has been a guest on the show, doing so much comedy locally across the state and different festivals across the country. So we have a lot of comedians. As well as today is the International Transgender Day of Visibility with the idea of just making people aware and educate to celebrate trans people and their accomplishments and contributions to society. So thank you all for joining us on this amazing March 31st. 
Now, what can you expect tonight? Well, you know, we have a little bit of trivia. We have From the Vault. We have a little bit of Little Arizona, some music history. We even have a beverage and, of course, an amazing guest. So thank you all so much for being here. Now, if this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, you know, I got here a little over 22 years ago to Arizona. I was living in Brooklyn. I was working at an old Carnegie building, big and beautiful, but you know, there was far too much snow, wind, and slush for my taste, so we decided it was time for a change. So we loaded up everything and moved to Phoenix, where I started working off in a little library in South Phoenix. And that had a rich old tradition of the community, and that was one of the things that kind of influenced me to be like, hey, you know, we really need to look more at our modern history. And so that heavily influenced me. And there is my house. That was promptly moved into that when we got to Arizona, a beautiful 1956 ranch. Now it is pretty much a time capsule. There's my kitchen looks like today, all that buttercream yellow tile with matching appliances. Oh my gosh, I love my house. Now, as soon as we got here, all we kept hearing about how there was no history here, but you know what? I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, whether it was on foot, on my bike, in a car, I would come face to face with so many amazing stories. And again, that's what got me doing just what I'm doing right now. And then there's all those GIs. And, you know, and I really think that they really changed Arizona and create, helped create the Arizona that we all know and love. All those GIs that were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. After the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, and I think in so many cases looking for a new way of life, and so many of them found exactly that. So I'm also called the hip historian. Now you might wonder, what does that mean? Well, that means I get to play with Arizona history and have oh so much fun. Why, coming up next week, we have our monthly Arizona Haunted History Tour. So let me know if you'd like to go on that and we can make that happen. All right. So coming up also next week, we have our Office of Phoenix Arts and Culture help sponsor an LGBT story time where we get a chance to talk about and chat about community history for the LGBT community. So that's going to be a lot of fun, followed by on Sunday. there Next Sunday, there is then we are doing a scan -a -thon a chance for people to bring in their photos, scan them as a way that we can share their stories with so many people. As well as the end of next month is Arizona Tiki Oasis. So I'm looking forward to just spending four days with some really cool folks celebrating Polynesian Kitsch. What a fun night or what a fun weekend that will be. Um, also coming up early next month is Ignite. It's so much fun. So be sure to check that out. It's going to be at Scottsdale Center for the Arts. And it's going to be a great time. And I've submitted, so we'll see if I get selected. As well as coming up, why in just a couple days, is over at Smoka. They are doing their gala, Luminescence. And so excited to be a part of that crowd pulling that off. So it's going to be an amazing night. And so if any of you would like to join me, I think there may still be a few tickets left. Now, also, I see a lot of you have found the chat session. You know, feel free to reach out through the chat. You can also reach out via Facebook, Instagram, email, or even through my website. All right. So now we are at a critical moment. So PJ, you know, is so great. It was like, basically, hey, PJ, by the way, I'm leaving for LA. What are we going to do? And so he was like, oh, I have the perfect thing. So I ran and grabbed. Oh, I opened it now. So it is Golden Road Brewing Company. And so they actually are kind of partners with Four Peaks. And so sometimes they will brew things for each other. 
they will collaborate, they will do a wide variety of things. And so PJ was like, you know, this is the perfect time to bring this up. And so when I ran to go get something, they had something called spicy mango cart. And it is indeed just kind of like something, you know, it's a little beer, a little mango, a little spice. So I think it's kind of the perfect thing for. Mm, oh, so tasty. All right. So here we are at Little Arizona. So we are going to talk about a little town called Happy Jack. Now, Happy Jack was a logging community. It also has a ranger station and a post office. And originally it was called Onion Flats. As well as also was called Yellow Jacket. Although there were other towns called Yellow Jacket, so they had to come up with a new name. And so they came up with the name Happy Jack. Now, as legend has it, it actually was named by the supervisor of the Coconino National Forest, named for a Wyoming bandit named Happy Jack, who was committing a crime spree across Wyoming. And somehow, you know, it's like, you know, we need that in Arizona. So that's how we got Happy Jack. It's quite a place to go. Actually, I've been here. Um, I had a friend we went years ago chasing the bugle. We were going to, we went up when the bull, bull elk were in mating season and we slept out in under the stars and listened to the bull elk all night calling back and forth. Now, I think one of the most beautiful things about this area is they have a telescope. It is the Lowell Discovery Telescope. It is kind of considered to be kind of the Swiss Army Knife and Telescopes because it can do so much. And that in order, it's actually now privately owned. And so it they do a lot of grant access to scientists all over the world to come and look through this telescope and view the universe and see what they can discern. They also do do public programming. So if you're ever up in that area, be sure and check out the Lowell Discovery Telescope. All right, well, now we have an amazing special guest. Oh my God, I am so excited to have Tiffany come on and share. Hello, Tiffany. Hey, how's it How going? It's good, and yourself? Doing great, thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I am so happy you can be here. <laughs> oh, we are gonna have some fun. Okay, you're gonna quiz me, huh? <laughs> well, you know, so what, I, so, okay. So everyone knows every, every week we always have trivia. And so the guest creates really fun trivia to kind of highlight what's going on in their world. And so this is no, oh, clicked on the wrong button. There we go. So Tiffany, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because people may not know who you are. Oh, sure. Um, my name is Tiffany Farrell. Um, I'm the chief curator at Mesa Contemporary Arts at the Mesa Art Center. So tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Mesa history, mostly uh, Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum history at the Mesa Art Center. So, um, and wait, a minute, so, so, wait a minute. So Mesa has an art museum? What? It actually has what? three, three art at uh, three museums. Uh, they have the Idea Museum, which is a children's museum. They have the Arizona Museum of Natural History, uh, which is also quite amazing if you're into dinosaurs and all those kind of conversations. And then, of course, a Contemporary Art Museum, which is where I work. Very cool. And um, yeah, I'm actually from Arizona, so I'm an Arizona native. I've been here for, well, my family's been here for two generations. My mom was born here, and I am wearing actually one of uh, an family heirloom. I'm wearing my oh, grandmother's squash Oh, blossom. really? Your, that squash blossom is from, oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it has a whole set and everything. You know, oh, it's, oh and look, everything. and the bracelets, as, wow, and yeah. the earrings, look at you. My grandma wore it all the time. My grandfather actually bought it for my grandma uh, when my mom was born um, in 1950. So, oh, very cool. Yeah. And I, I, I provided a lovely photo of my grandparents, actually, of them um, in 1948. So um, they, uh, that was the time they actually came here. And this actually photograph was taken according to the back that my grandmother wrote on the back of it, saying it was at Camelback and 44th Street. 
What do you think? Do you think that swirl's still standing? <laughs> wow, I doubt it. Doubt it too. It's changed so much. I mean, it's like there's no pavement. Nope. There's no buildings, no apartment buildings. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they actually built their house on Thomas and 44th Street. Um, and they came out here from Chicago. So uh, yeah, my family roots are from the Midwest. As a lot, a lot of... Uh, and I'm the France, same way. France. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got here via Indiana. Yeah. And so indeed. All right. So now when we do trivia, the fun thing is we don't you do your standard trivia. It's like we like to... They're A, they're multiple choice. So that way, you, if you don't know the answer, all you got to do is guess. The other beautiful thing is we don't just leave you hanging in terms of, oh, the answer is this. We will come back in a little bit and talk about the answers and help explain them. So that way you'll know, you know, so that way when you go to show to a cocktail party, because, you know, those are starting to happen now. You'll be able to have a great conversation with your friends and talk about a Mesa that they might be astounded that it exists yes yeah, so they have to come and visit me <laughs> indeed i know i've been to visit you visit many me. times even re with the current exhibit that was there so yeah all right so let's start off with question one so when was the mesa art center established was it a 1974 b 1980 c 2000 or d 2005 when do you think the Mesa Art Center was first established? All right. Well, you're trying to think about when were the kids born? What was going on? When could this have happened? We're going to move on to question two, which is what was the Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum originally called? Was it A, the Galleria Mesa, B, Mesa Art Center, C, Museum Mesa or D, Museum of Contemporary Art. Hmm, what was it first called? All right, moving on to question three. What was Galleria Mesa's first exhibit? A, Potpourri. B, Northern Exposure. C, Vaki, Juried Competition and Show. D, Arizona Designer Craftsman, or E, all of the above. So what do you think was the very first exhibit? All right. Question four. What was featured in the Mesa Center for the Arts Museum during its inaugural season at its current location in that beautiful building? All right. Was it A? Deborah Butterfield, B, Michael Shaughnessy, C, Joyce J. Scott, D, Luis Jimenez, or E, all of the above. All right, moving on to that halfway point. Here we are at question five. Which contemporary artist has been featured in memorandum at the Mesa Center for the Arts Museum? Was it A, Randy Turk, B, David Pimpental, C. Pedro Guerrero, D. Philip Curtis, or E. All of the above. All right, moving on because you know who do you think was featured in memoriam at the art at the museum? All right, which artist installed a permanent mural at the Mesa Art Center? A. Such styles. B, Tato Carvalho, C, L, Mack, D, Kaylin Manny, or E, all of the above. All right, so which artist do you think installed a permanent mural at the Mesa Art Center? All right, question seven. Which Mesa artist had a solo exhibit at the museum? A, John Dawson, B, William Barnhart, C, Corinne Gertzton, or D, Jeff Reich, or E, all of the above. All right, moving on to question eight. The museum has a collection of more than 900 objects. 
Which Arizona artist outside the Phoenix area has artwork in the collection? Is it A, Christina Cardenas, B, Brian David Griffith, C, Daniel Martinez Diaz, or D, Aaron Coleman, or E, all of the above? All right, moving on to question nine. What artist have featured have done music album covers? Let me read that again. What artists have featured and done music album covers? All right, Beatrice, Beatrice Carone, B. Robert Williams, C. Um, Ieso. Am I saying that right, Tiffany? Oh, Eso. Esau, Esau Andrews, or D, Alex Gray, or E, all of the above. All right. Well, we're coming to the close because here is question 10. What should artists do to have their work seen by you and other colleagues? All right. A, relentlessly call email proposals and i think just camp out in front of the front door <laughs> all right so or another option is show up with your portfolio at any time c corner us at an event or an opening <laughs> oh good luck you're so busy running around nobody could corner you because, I mean, you're like zip, 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 zip all over the place. So. Even at another opening or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, look, there's Tiffany at the grocery store. Let's... I know. Sir. Well, I got a story. <laughs> oh, all right. Or D, research the institution and follow the, the proposal process. All right. So while you are thinking about that. We are going to go on and talk about a little bit of Arizona music. And so kind of keeping with an Arizona and a Mesa theme, although I'm going to have some spicy mango cart. <laughs> I'm having a hot tea. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, it's actually really chilly here. It was like in the 60s today. Well, and I'm in a museum, so it's a little chilly in the museum. Oh, indeed, because things have to be kept climate controlled absolutely you gotta preserve so we that art are, exactly gotta keep it fresh for everybody all right so we are going to talk about jimmy eats world so they started first back in 1993 in mesa they first started as kind of a punk rock band and the name actually comes from one of the brothers kind of being annoyed and playing and drawing a picture of one of one of the founders of the group and entitling it it was basically he was eating the earth with his mouth and so it was entitled jimmy eat world so that's where this group got their name from now i one of the things i love about a the photo on the left the right hand side is that it's actually taken to the ice house which is an amazing venue downtown phoenix but jimmy eat world is very much a mesa group they have just finished doing a tour this was actually done i think in nashville and they have i think up to 10 albums they've done already and working on new music so if you've not heard of jimmy eat world please go check them out and get a little mesa music going in your house all right so who is ready for some answers I have no <laughs> Tiffany is. I have no doubt. I mean, she's looking great in her squash blossom. And so, <laughs> all right. So when was the Mesa Art Center established? Yes, it was actually 1980, um, around that time. And um, it was actually part of the cultural program. And it was housed in the old Irvine School, which is named after Washington Irvine. Um, and that used to be on 2nd Street and Center. Um, and it was actually known as the Mesa Activity Center. And uh, that building itself was uh, built during the Great Depression and is now on the registered historic buildings. So, um, yeah, it's actually a really cool building. And the other dates in there I had for fun. You know, 1974 is when the Equal Credit Opportunity Act was, you know, I mean, we are talking about the last day of 
Women's Month. So thank you exactly. so much for having me. <laughs> and 2000 was actually um, the year the museum was renamed um, and to Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. And then in 2005 uh, was when Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum was moved to its current location at the Mesa Art Center here on uh, Center and Main Street in downtown Mesa. Ah, oh, very cool. All right. So question two, what was the Missionary Arts Museum originally called? Galleria Mesa. Yep. And um, yeah, it, it, and that confuses people. The people still call us gallery or galleria or, you know, um, and we're like, no, we're a museum. I mean, what differentiates you from a museum and a gallery is we have a collection. And so that's why it makes us a museum. And uh, I eventually would love to change this to Museum of Contemporary Art because people have a hard time remembering Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. It's just a mouthful. So I'd love to call us Mesa, you know, Mesa uh, Museum of Contemporary Art at Mesa Art Center makes so much more sense to me, but what, we'll get what, there what, eventually. What would that new acronym be? MC? Well, uh, well uh, what acronym me? Mason. Well, you're, you're, well, the new if you if you called it the Masonry Art Museum, I just I, it's like because everything is always the an acronym. So yeah, well, it would be the same as MCA because we're called MCA now, MCA Museum. Okay. So it would make sense just to call us MCA, you know. So the same. don't tell it, don't tell anyone, just change it. I know. Well, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> welcome to welcome to working for a city. You got hoops to jump through. You know, <laughs> in, in, working for indeed. government. <laughs> But, you know, but I just love that whole art center. I mean, it's, it's such cool. a gym. And, you know, it people is. haven't been there before. They really need to go because it really is spectacular. It, it really is. It's really the anchor of especially the downtown community. It's, it's stunning. We have also amazing programs here. Um, and then now we're going to be, they're building the ASU's new um, Sydney Potier School. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this area is going to be hopping, hopefully. You know, I'm saying, I mean, it already is hopping, but it is going to be more hopping in the next five years, especially. So I think it's just going to get even better. And all the tech industry that's happening in the web, in the east part of Mesa, it's, yeah, they're doing some cool things here. And Indeed, they are. All right. So what was the Galleria's first exhibition? Yeah, it's it's such a weird, um, weird thing. It, it was actually the Viking exhibition. And that term, they actually, today we would look back on it being like a, a appropriation. And it actually comes from who come history. Um, and um, it was referring to a time in, um, in who come culture where they had great ceramics, textiles. It was all these different craft mediums. And it was actually the um, beginning of our craft tradition and show, highlighting, you know, craft medium. So that was what it was originally called for, for many, many years. And um, uh, my predecessor, Patty Hopperman, actually helped uh, with the changing of it to the annual craft exhibition when we were at the old building and then it continued on to here. So, yeah. The other titles though that I provided, um, Potpourri was actually um, an exhibition where we featured Mesa Art Center uh, uh, teachers you know, some of the faculty or the studio artists, the teacher at the Mesa Art Center. And we've actually done that several times where we focus on our different areas of emphasis at the Art Center. We've done metals, glass, the graphic arts, which include like drawing, painting, printmaking. Um, and we actually did that again recently um, in uh, 2020. You know, the museum was shut down during the pandemic for nine months um, from March of 2020 to December. And uh, we put uh, together an exhibition highlighting um, our studio artists in the theater windows. So uh, we do like to, I mean, we have amazing talent here and we hire amazing talent. So Northern Exposure focused on Prescott photography. Um, that was during the early time of the museum. And then um, the Arizona designer craftsman, we've done that a couple times. We did it again in summer of 2010. Um, so you can see there's a long history with us for craft um, that has been throughout throughout the uh, history of the art center. Well, and people may not realize that you can take classes out there. 
Oh yeah. I mean, and I love the glass blowing. Be, oh. Being able to go up the stairs and yes. look over and peek as they're dip, dipping their tubes into that molten oh, yeah. glass vat and into the furnaces as they sit there and work the glass. That is so much fun to do after a show. Yeah, there's some amazing, we, our ceramic studio is phenomenal. Uh, we have a wonderful metal studio um, and they do, uh, we have lapidary, jewelry. Um, and we also have performance art classes too. I think we've, we've done yoga classes. You know, they do a lot of children's programming here. They have an arts and service program, um, which is for vets, um, you know, and how arts can heal. We, we have a lot of amazing programs that are here at the Art Center, in addition to, of course, our theaters. Right. Of course. Right. I mean, the three may cool theaters. So, yeah. yeah. They were the theaters weren't part of the old Mac. Um, that actually was a new addition at this new location. So. Indeed. All right. So who were the featured in the museum during its inaugural season at its new location? Well, not new, but its current location. Yes. Its current location. From the Irvine School. Yeah. Um, and it was all of the above. Uh, Patty Haberman, my predecessor, put together an amazing lineup. I mean, you had Deborah. I mean, it was like a who's who in the uh, contemporary art world. You know, Deborah Butterfield, um, as you can see here. Uh, Michael Shaughnessy. I understand that was real fun to put together. Um, a lot of some people were allergic to hay. So um, <laughs> they had quite quite an install project with that. Um, Joy Scott, uh, if people aren't familiar with her, she does amazing commentaries on Black American culture, um, and she's a she's a bead artist. She's phenomenal. And then uh, Luis Jimenez. Um, it was such a bummer. We we had to get rid. We we couldn't get. We didn't get to keep his sculpture. Um, that sculpture that's at the front of our museum was there for many years until he died, um, and then his. His uh, wife actually called back all the work. Uh, we had a piece there and a piece in our courtyard. And um, yeah, they they were amazing. We really wanted oh, them. I didn't realize what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. They After he, he was killed by the, well, we like to call it the evil horse. Um, <laughs> so he was killed by one of, you know, one of his sculptures. Um, it's the one at the Denver Art, uh, Denver Airport. And um, yeah, so... Anyway, yeah, it was a bummer. We would have loved them. We would have given them good homes. <laughs> All right. And which of your artists have been featured in memory at the museum? Yeah, it was all of them. Um, we've showcased several artists. We kind of call them um, legacy exhibitions. Uh, normally, we, we work on contemporary artists and mostly living artists. So contemporary, we kind of look at as after World War II to present. But um, it was funny. I was talking to somebody and they were like, wow, you really focus on really contemporary. And I'm like, yeah, most of the artists are alive. So uh, but there are a few times where we focused on past ones. Um, Rudy Turk and um, was actually an artist that was being featured when I started coming on. Um, Rudy was director of the ASU Art Museum, which is where I came from. Um, so he was there for many years and it was always so fun to come across like his letters. He was always so, so polite and very almost poetic in the way his letters were in our archives over there. And so it was really cool to see his show. And the piece on the right is actually a piece in our collection um, by Rudy. So he was very instrumental in their starting their ceramics collection over at the ASU Art Museum. Ah, which they have an amazing ceramics collection. It's it's really phenomenal. Yes. And then uh, David Pimentel uh, was one of a, an early exhibition that I came on and worked on um, when when I first started my career here. I've been here 16 years now. And so uh, David Pimentel was an instructor. Um, of the metals program at ASU for many years. He was known for working in copper and doing those vessels. Um, and his exhibition was in the summer of 2006. And it showcased not only him, but also some of his students' work. So, you know, it's really cool almost to see like the legacy of his teaching. Pedro Guerrero was another one we featured. That oh, was in the fall of yeah. 2015. You recognize him. I mean, talk about iconic. You can't look at a Frank Lloyd Wright photograph without knowing that was, I mean, that was done by Pedro. So right. we had that, we worked with his wife, uh, with his wife, Dixie, 
um, on that exhibition, which was, it was wonderful. Um, and that was during our 10 year anniversary at here at this location at the Mesa Art Center, uh, where we featured an exhibition um, highlighting Cheech Marine's collection of Chicano art too. So it was really kind of a celebration of Mexican Americans. Nice. And then, and then of course, Philip Curtis, everyone knows him as one of the people that helped start the Phoenix Art Museum. You know, he um, had his house at Cattle Track and uh, we had uh, Philip uh, in two, fall of 2014 um, with an exhibition lineup that we had themed uh, with circus, uh, art influenced by circus memorabilia. So we had some of his um, ephemera toys that he used um, uh, for his artwork and um, we were able to um, borrow from Cattle Track some of the costumes too that inspired um in some of his work well i mean that's why I, I that's one of the things i loved was like going to this um this opening and running into like janie ellis yes was oh, so great so i wonderful. mean that was so much fun that night well that's and that was who we actually borrowed the uh dresses from. i mean her costume collection is phenomenal i think the phoenix art museum did a catalog of that um that collection oh, and everything oh i didn't realize that that yeah. is great yeah it was it's so really cool. much so now, okay, so Tim, before we go on, so Andrew does have a question and I'm gonna floor it on screen. So what does a collection mean, exactly mean versus a gallery collection? Uh, I don't know about gallery collection, but, uh, but a collection is like anything. Some people collect Hummels, some people collect, you know, different objects. We um, get donations from people. We don't really have what's called an acquisitions budget. Uh, where we could go out and purchase pieces for the collection. So these are objects that are part um, that we house. We've promised to take care of them, usually from donors or artists. Like the piece behind me, that's a piece that belongs to the museum collection, which means it's property of the city of Mesa. So, and that's, we're basically the caretakers uh, for that property. And we showcase it, we, you know, lend them out. Um, we put them into exhibitions. Some people do research on them. So that's what, when I refer to collection, that's what I mean. But, you know, collection is, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, exa exactly. It's kind of something that you, you take care, you're a caretaker of. Yeah. And so as opposed to a gallery, which is pretty much not there to caretake, it's there to sell and move They're, on and go to the well, next Well, yeah, place. that's what really a gallery is. They sell um, artwork, um, but, you know, so mostly it's mostly sell artwork and we do have the ability to sell, which makes us an unusual museum. Um, our commission mm -hmm. is only 25%. Most galleries are 50%, but you know, like I said, being a museum means we have a collection. That's what makes us different than a gallery. They don't usually hold on to objects. If they do, it's usually in storage for an exhibition or for the artist in inventory. All right, so which artist installed a permanent mural at the Mesa Art Center? Al Mack. Indeed. Um, Al Mack, man. Um, so we featured actually all of those artists. Um, Such Styles did next, um, did two walls uh, when, when uh, one of the first exhibitions I worked on was about tattoos and, um, or art influenced by tattoos. It was called Beneath the Skin. And um, so I had one room where it was like, we called it the, the salon, like almost like a tattoo salon. And um, he graffitied the walls and it was an education area to talk about tattoos and the history of tattoos. Um, Cause there's a lot of stereotypes with things. And also how people, different people will associate different things with different tattoos. I mean, if you were Jewish from World War II, a tattoo is gonna have very different significance for you than if you're a Chicano, you know, uh, fighting right. in World War II, um, for example. You know, a lot of times they would put like the Virgin of Guadalupe as a protection symbol on themselves instead of wearing a medal. Um, so it, it was a really good educational tool. One thing I think you'll find interesting too was, did you know that Winston Churchill's mother had a tattoo? Oh. Yeah. No, that's shocking. Yeah, that was part of that show too, because, you know, it was very uh, popular in vogue at the time because of Captain Cook's voyage. <laughs> but, wow. Yeah. So, and Such actually has a show coming up uh, this fall. Uh, oh, Such cool. and Champ. 
Yeah. Okay, I was, I was gonna say. I was, I was like, I was like, well, now you've got such. It's like we need Champ to get in there as well. They are. They're both. They're both doing it. So father and nice. son tag team. They're they're both working on it. Tato, um, we had him do a wonderful mural from our Jazz It Up exhibition. So that's the mural. It's beautiful work. Um, he's actually going to be in an upcoming exhibition too called uh, Somo Southwest, which is featuring um, Judson and Nancy Ball's uh, Chicano inspired collection. Because not all the artists are Chicano. So that's why we call it inspired. Um, as you can imagine, Chicano art has been such an inspiration for a variety of artists, especially if you're living in the Southwest. So, and then Keelan Manning, uh, we've had her several times uh, for different festivals. And um, so she's done different inter, um, community based murals here. And she was actually in an, uh, our exhibition uh, most recently uh, a bit, uh, that focused on the visionary art movement because for right. Angela's and things like that. So, yeah. And then, and right, and then you've got, I mean, and then there's L Mac and Mac. Yeah, L Mac. Um, that was a proposal I gave um, our director, uh, Cindy Ornstein. Um, she was like asking, what should we do to commemorate the 10 year anniversary here at this new location? And I said, well, we need, a, we need an L Mac at the Mac. And um, <laughs> that was my pitch, you know? <laughs> And come on, you know, we have this blank canvas in the courtyard since we lost Luis Jimenez. I'm like, we need we need art in our courtyard. And so um, luckily, you know, she made it happen. And Al Mac was game. He really wanted to leave that impression. And that mural is beautiful. I mean, it um, it's a conversation about, you know, um, the, the woman, her name's Karen. And uh, she's actually pregnant in it. And we wanted to have, I look at the Mesa Art Center as a she, like a ship. And she's like our masthead of the ship. And she also faces the light rail. So it was during the time when the light rail was being installed. She's kind of a welcoming symbol. Um, people take photographs of her all the time. And um, Karen is originally from uh, Guatemala. So it is like a, um, a homage to, you know, people that are immigrants that have come here and helped make our country uh, great. And she actually gave birth to the baby uh, the night of El Mac's um, opening. And El Mac is the uh, godfather of the baby. So it's just, <laughs> I mean, it's his best friend's wife. So it's like this whole really cool serendipitous, I don't know, it's just so sweet. The whole thing has just got a great story behind it. So. All right, so question seven. Which made Mesa artist had a solo exhibition at the museum? Yeah, all of the above. I thought it's important for us to focus on Mesa. We have amazing talent, not only talent in Arizona, but also in our city. And so we had a wonderful um, retrospect exhibition with John Dawson. And um, the reason I focused on these artists was because we also have pieces by them in the collection. So that piece um, was from the exhibition and John actually gave it to us, uh, which was wonderful. Oh, so his nice. is, yes, his are really psychological, you know, conversations um, with his paintings. So yeah, he's, he's such a, he's such a sweetheart, such a delight. He was one of my favorites. William Barnhart, he's just down the street. We've worked with him several times. The piece on the right is actually an older piece. So it's actually cool to see, you know, his newer work. Uh, we had his show in summer of 2015. And then that piece is a uh, much older work. So you could kind of see that he had his style has evolved. So right. Corinne Gertzden, we've had her twice. She actually did two proposals to us. Um, and you know, it's funny. We like to share the wealth. You know, we don't we don't want to, you know, we'll have artists who apply over and over again. And, you know, even though they've had a show and we want to there's so many amazing talent here. We want to have a variety and showcase as many artists as we can. And but Corinne really her second proposal was just as interesting and just diverse enough from her first. And the second one, she asked various our, uh, writers. Um, she had like a contest to write the stories based off of her uh, psychological digital art. And so uh, oh, wow. in the winner, she would actually give them one of her prints, one of her pieces. I'm like, I wish I would have, I should have written one. That would have been amazing. Right. Probably the college right. universe, but you know, right. but yeah. Then the piece um, from the collection is just so delightful, very whimsical and 
playful and I just there's all these cool details. The elephant is from the Phoenix Zoo. Uh, she photographed the elephant and um, the band around its stomach is actually our husband's wedding band. So there's just all those sorts of fun. Uh, nice. It's called delivering peace. Boy, isn't that appropriate nowadays with uh, the Ukraine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> conversation. Indeed. And then Jeff Reich, uh, amazing ceramic artist. He was actually um, the uh, ceramic instructor here at the Mesa Art Center. He helped, was very instrumental in the building of the ceramics studios here at the Mesa Art Center. And he was... Um, he got a solo show because he was a winner of one of the craft exhibitions back in, he was the winner in 2015. So his exhibition was in 2016. And that other, um, the piece that's on the left is from our collection and it's underneath our stairway. And I don't know if you can see him, but you see one of the lizard hiding out next to him. Oh yeah. That was when we were closed during the pandemic and the Phoenix zoo brought some um, some of their creatures and we let them roam the gallery. It was so fun. So that I forgot what his name was, but yeah, he was he was just he was really digging on the Jeff Reich. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. Our the museum has a collection of more than 900 objects. Which Arizona artist outside the Phoenix metro area has artwork in the collection? Yeah, for this one, I wanted to really, you know, there's always so much emphasis on Phoenix Central, you know, and so I wanted to showcase and say, hey, you know, we have amazing artists all over our state. And uh, so, you know, this is Christina Cardenas. She um, is in our collection. She's actually going to be in the so uh, Somos Southwest exhibition coming up. So we've got this wonderful piece. Brian David Griffith, you know, uh, by the way, Christina's from Tucson and Brian is from Flagstaff. And uh, we had this wonderful exhibition with his work. And the piece on the right is a new acquisition to the collection. Um, Daniel, and yeah, uh, his work was a conversation. He worked with the fire department and um, was talking about how, you know, fire is actually part of the ecosystem and really important to help um you have to have controlled fires. It's important for that in, um, in forest areas and things like Flagstaff, which is why they do controlled burns. So, and how important that is. So, and he, he did his work in, in encaustic on quite a few of them, which was a really cool. Oh, wow. Smoke in encaustic. This is a work on, uh, this is smoke on paper, but uh, yeah, it's wow. pretty cool. And then um, Daniel Martin Diaz, he's another artist we've actually had uh, two solo exhibitions with, and he's been several mm -hmm. shows. Uh, phenomenal, um, actually self-taught artist, if you could believe it. Uh, oh, I know he was self-taught. He's self-taught, um, inspired by, um, you know, Spanish colonial style and Mexican art and Tucson artist. So he's quite phenomenal. Aaron Coleman, um, Tucson artist. We had an ex he was uh, an exhibition winner. Um, his show was phenomenal. He, um, had conversations about, you know, uh, police brutality and black American experience. And also about, um, you know, he used to the Jack and Jill, um, you know, from, you know, the old, you know, the old oh, right. imagery and stuff like that is conversations, you know, talking about opportunities and how um, some of those opportunities have been not for everybody. And it was, it was a very, very good show. Uh, we also have, you know, other artists like Paula Whitner, who's from Patagonia. I don't know if people know that we have a city called Patagonia here in Arizona. We've had Chris uh, Rush. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's from Tucson, and um, his exhibition was called Stair. And the piece on the right we just acquired in our collection. Um, it's it was from that exhibition Stair. And it was about uh, people with disabilities and how we have a tendency to marginalize and put them in a corner and don't want to see them. And he's like, no, they're beautiful. Let's bring them front and center and showcase them too. Um, and so that was, it was a really good show. Kate Brakey, that's the artist behind me. So uh, she's a Tucson artist and yeah, we've had, we've had some, we have some amazing artists in our collection. All right, question nine. What artists have featured have also done music album covers? 
all of the above. Beatrice, oh my gosh. I know. Beatrice Coran, we had her. She's originally from France, lives in New York. Uh, she does the album covers for um, Dave Matthews Band. She does, um, there's a cut paper. So on actually Tyvek, you know, which is the paper you use on your. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, and then um, yeah, next one is Robert Williams. He did uh, the Guns N' Roses covers. Um, so he did a few of those. So that was a fun lineup. Esau Andrews, uh, Circa Survive. We had him in summer of 2019. He grew up in Mesa, actually. And we actually did a concert oh. with Circa Survive in the exhibition space, which was so fun. And then nice. most recently, in fall of 21, we had um, the Tool cover artist, Alex Gray. Um, and we actually had Tool's um, drum kit on display for a little period before it had to go on tour with them. But it was, it was a really <laughs> cool lineup. That's really cool. Yeah, that was such a great exhibition. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. And the last right. one is research the institution and follow the proposal process. Um, and I provided um, some information about our pr uh, prospectus that's going to come out in May. This is the old one. As you can probably recognize Cloty on the cover. Uh, she did... Uh, she did an exhibition with us uh, when we reopened. Um, that was a conversation about Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And so, but yeah, please don't pester us um, and write a proposal. We do look at everything at one time early in the following year, because the deadlines are usually in December, um, except for the craft show. That one's usually in October. But um, yeah, I had, it was so funny. I remember when I was single and I was, um, you know, I, I was at a club, I think it was, or something like that with a friend. And I was dancing with some guy and he was really like, you know, I don't know. They, people always ask what you do. And I told him I do. And then he goes, oh, I'm an artist. And he's like, check out my work, whips out his phone. And I'm like, dude, okay. <laughs> it's just End no. of dance and everything else. In the middle of the nightclub, showing me his art on his phone. Yeah, don't do that. Just saying. First of all, <laughs> That is just like you total friend, friend zoned. And second, <laughs> right? yeah, no. Maybe, <laughs> not, I, the way to maybe look not even friend zoned at that point. Yeah, I know. I was like, okay, we're going to go away now. <laughs> <laughs> I see what your motivations are here. <laughs> All right. So next question we always ask everybody is how did they do? But we always be sure to tell them. It's like, you know, it's not what you got right. But look at the great stories, you know. So, Tiffany, how can people find more about the museum? I mean, what are the upcoming shows? I mean, we know Such and Champ have a show coming up. Yeah, they're coming how, up in fall. Okay, nice. Yeah, they're coming up in fall. Um, right now, we're actually putting up the exhibition, um, Monica Isa Martinez. Her exhibition is coming up now. Um, she will open April 8th. And then... Um, We've got uh, Lalo Cota. Some people may recognize his work if you've bought the Arizona Lotto tickets for the last two years for day, their day, day of the Dead Lotto tickets. So um, he's actually going to be coming up in our Arizona uh, exhibition space. We call it the North Gallery. Um, Lan Tanner, uh, uh, Laura Tanner, uh, she's going to be having an exhibition. She has wonderful feminist commentaries. And she's actually, her exhibition is a commentary about how... Um, we use different food terms and serving, you know, like breadwinner, for example, and stuff like that, and how very gender associated those are and where they come from and, and things like that. Uh, Somo Southwest um, is uh, going to be featuring Judson Ball and Nancy Ball's collection of Chicano inspired art. And then Eliza Wu. Um, she's an artist out of, I think it's Texas. I think she's from Texas. And she's a proposal winner. Oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. She does ceramic, but it's actually creating a room where you can walk into, suspended mm -hmm. from the ceiling. Um, and it's based off of different patterns that are used in um, sacred spaces. So should be fun. It'll be really good. The opening is uh, May 13th, starts at uh, seven o'clock. So um, I hope people will join. It's Friday night. We're going to have uh, a DJ and, and all. it's always fun. You've been. Yeah, yes. no, it, right, it, exactly. Right. <laughs> I mean, your, your openings are always fun. And there's so much going on in Mesa now. I mean, that's the cool thing is, you know, go spend the entire evening in Mesa. Oh, yeah, there's some great restaurants. 
I mean, yeah, you can't, you can't, you, yeah, there's some amazing things. So definitely check us out. we got some good new ones. You know, we've got a new Indian, we have a new fry bread place that's going to be opening up too. So I'm kind of, oh, wow. I think it's called Hope's Fry Bread. Curious to try that. Can't wait. Yeah. And for them. I don't even know them, but I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> right. No, exactly. Well, and also tell us about the fall preview. Cause I love the prof fall preview as well. Oh, well, thank you. Um, fall, we're actually going to be highlighting Ron English. Um, we had him a couple years ago. Uh, well, actually, when I first started, one of the first exhibitions I worked on was with um, Mike Goodwin, who's also amazing. I'm so happy he's with the Idea Museum now. Uh, but he's also not only a in exhibition designer, but he's also a, a, a good curator. So um, we had an exhibition called Beyond the Cell. So Ron does a lot of popular culture inspired works. You may recognize his work in Super Size Me, um, but he um, it is a commentary about our consumer's culture. So we have that, Such and Champ, and we're also featuring the Mole Skin Project, which is great. Spoke Art, uh, put together by Spoke Art, um, and uh, they are a gallery um, in Mole Skin. Actually, I've got an example here. Are the sketchbooks right, that artists yeah. use? And, but what they do is they actually have the different spreads out and then you hang them on the wall. So oh. we're going to have, I think, 150 of these books uh, on display and framed um, as part of the fall. Um, yeah, it's going to, it'll be a really great opening. And the we're kind of theming it with the festival is called Make Your Mark, you know, because um, it's actually a fun commentary i'm trying to take back for the graffiti artists that was used in 1980s against graffiti artists um in new york and uh that was the campaign they used make your mark um in, in society and not on the walls and so i'm kind of twisting it and as a commentary as, as a call for social action what are you doing to make things better in society and also you make your mark in sketchbooks you know we're going to have like Probably a program we're looking at calling it Drink and Draw, you know, and uh, you can do your own sketches. And um, so, yeah, we've got some wonderful in the season kickoff. It's going to be a lot of fun and it's always a lot of fun. So, well, you know, and you should also um, and for that include, um, I think it was AIA um, several years ago for Arizona Design Week. They actually brought in the guy who created Moleskins. Really? Oh, that's yeah. cool. And so that was super fun to hear him talk about kind of what he was doing now and kind of how moleskins evolved. And so. Oh, I'm going to have to look into that. Thank you. That's a great tip. Yeah. So, I mean, and that was, that was so much fun. So, so Tiffany, thank you so much for coming on and sharing one of my favorite museums in the Valley. Thank you. Thank I you, mean, and, yeah so hey and, and vote that, for us with new times or something we want to invest museum again we've done it twice but we need it again indeed and you can now take light rail right there which is or super right cool yes. yeah exactly and free i mean it you can't beat it the price is perfect not, it's free right not, ju people. not just one day a week every but, yeah every day except monday mondays were closed but we're normally open you know, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then Sunday from noon to 5. Very cool. And then you can also go do so many other things in Mesa as well. So absolutely very cool. So, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing the museum's history with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody are, enjoyed themselves. <laughs> I know I did, and I learned a ton and got to see some friends, some of their art, which is always a great thing. Absolutely. So, all right. Have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Oh, my gosh. That was so much fun. I love the Miss Art Museum. And so one of the things I'd like, so we talked about kind of the whole mural thing. Is So From the Vault is basically talking about art. And so there's a brand new mural up on Roosevelt and Central. So if you're ever there, there's a light rail station. And so there's this huge kind of shade, hanging shade structure that moves in the wind. And just behind it, Tato did this great mural of Chef Silvana. And so I wanted to highlight not only Tato's work, but also the fact that there also is Robert Miley and his release, The Fear Statue, which is made out of melted guns and other weapons. And I wanted to highlight that Roosevelt and Central because, you know, it's kind of, 
hidden. If you don't know what you're looking at, you will miss the Silvana mural. But I love that as you go around the state, when you go visit Tucson, underpasses, there are all these murals. And I just love there was one now being done for the lowrider community. That as you're driving under a, a underpass, suddenly it's like, there's this great art. So as you explore, and I know um, Superior just did their mural festival. So I love that there's all different kinds of way to go experience art and those murals. So I didn't mean to really just focus on Arizona because it's like, or Phoenix, but you know, I love that Tucson's doing that and kind of hidden out of the way, as well as some of the great murals that were recently just done for the mural festival they had up in Superior. So now you'll see why I say, you know, you should share. And so next week we have coming up Ken Clark, who was in the legislator, who is a realtor, uh, was one of the co-founders of um, Festivus, a good friend. We've done so much together. And so I'm really excited to have him on as a guest and talking about kind of some, pol some fun, quirky political history of Arizona. Now, also with that, I'll give you a little tease. So I'm here in LA tomorrow. I get to interview Troy Walker. Now, Troy Walker um, grew up in Chandler and beca became this fairly well-known musician, not necessarily in Arizona, but has become kind of like the toast of Hollywood. So I'm very excited to get a chance to sit down with him and talk about his time in Arizona. So we will see what makes it into next week's show for Arizona Music, but you already know I'm going to talk about Troy Walker. So looking so forward to that, as well as we'll have on Ken. So that's going to be an amazing show. And so that is next week, next Thursday, 7 o'clock, same time, same place, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, whatever, you can find us. So I, again, I want to thank you all for joining us as we get a chance to talk about some just cool Arizona history. And I'm going to leave you because, you know, we're kind of in that little wonky where the weather is kind of really cool. Now, I also want to give a shout out. If you didn't get a chance to throw something in the chat, you want to reach out to me, you can still do that through various ways. I like to always give a shout out to Chris and Cole who did that amazing video at the intro and for PJ who helped hook me up today with our, oh, there's my camera, Golden Road Spicy Mango Cart, which is oh so tasty. Now as an outro, um, because of kind of the weather, um, I know we have wildflowers blooming. There's lots of things going on. It's like, we're gonna watch from 1960 a Dristan commercial. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.